Welcome back to my channel. Today's episode is about a Vintage Buffet Academy clarinet, or actually multiple types of Academy clarinets. If you find this useful, don't forget to give a thumbs up, like, subscribe, and share. R113s were also known as the Academy model, which was supposedly identical to the R13 with some minor defaults such as body or key scratched. But apparently the buffets from 38,000 through 41,000 were designed with a lower joint a bit too large. Now this statement may cause some confusion. The term R13 is generally identified as the buffet model released in 1955 around serial number 50,500. But the R13 identifier is actually a model number based on keyword features. R13 being standard BOEM keyword. Let's take a look at a brochure of buffets from back in the day. Remember the Academy model was, num was R113. They basically added a one in front of the one three, I guess, just to say, hey, it's kind of somewhat like an R13. But then we'll see in pictures of Academy models, there were different types of Academy models, actually. So let's take a look at examples first and first understand what R13 is. It's a model number of the keyword. Here we have an old buffet page here. It shows different model numbers here. The model number R13 was regular BOEM keyword. On the top item here, we have an R13 and a half. This is a 1950-55 model Massabor clarinet, one which I had, which is a beautiful instrument to have. Lovely sounding, nice and powerful, great tone, not just the, the R13 being just a little bit better than this, but if I want a larger bore clarinet, fuller sounding than the regular R13, the one just before the R13, I would love to have that. I had one before I sold it. Kind of wish I was able to keep it, but hey, maybe I'll get another one in the future. I actually have RC, RC Prestige, which is very much as equal though. Anyways, the R13 and a half is an 18 key with six rings. In, in there it says it exact, it's exactly like the model R13, except that it has the articulated G-sharp key. That's the C-sharp, G-sharp key, or pinky. And it facilitates many passages that are difficult with a regular G-sharp key. The R, model R14 is 17 keys in seven rings. The CG tone hole, the left third finger, now has a ring on it. This model has the extra E flat, B flat mechanism with the ring for the third finger of the left hand. This ring plus the fourth B flat facilitates rapid passages from G sharp or A flat and eliminates many difficult fingerings. At least that's what they say. The model R14 and a half. You think these half things are weird? Wait till I get to, to the three, quarter, three quarters one in a minute. The R14 and a half is 18 keys and seven rings. The addition of the articulated G sharp mechanism and the extra E flat B flat third ring mechanism eliminates many otherwise difficult fingerings. G sharp trills and cross fingerings become easier with the articulated G sharp key mechanism. And you know, a regular, we look at the first one up here, you just see the regular key work here, but over here, you'll see the articulated G sharp. C sharp, G sharp key right there. This here, the trill key pushes down a little vent key right there. So does that tone key there. The ring key pushes that little vent key down. R14 and a half. Further changes. R16. That adds another key here for your left hand pinky key. The E flat, A flat lever. Uh, here it is, model R16, 19 keys, 7 rings. This complete, improved BOEM system clarinet includes forked B-flat, articulated G-sharp key, and the extra E-flat, A-flat lever. Allows you for more fingerings, of course. Now keep in mind, every the standard BOEM is a regular R13. All the additional keys past that is called an enhanced BOEM. Could be one flavor of a variety of ones we have here, of course, as we see here. R13 half, 14, 14 and a half, 16, 16 and a half. 
Then we get to the full BOM, which is all the additional key work. That's called the R16 and three quarters. <laughs> what in this you R16 and a half or R17? Who knows, right? I don't know who actually named these things. And you can find these model numbers going back to the early 1900s when they first started using BOM keyworks and enhanced BOMs. For the R16 and three quarters, has 20 keys, seven rings. This is the complete improved BOM system clarinet and includes articulated G-sharp key, forked E-flat, B-flat, and E-flat, A-flat lever. It has the low E-flat for players who desire to use a single clarinet and transpose A clarinet scores. I used to play full BOMs once in a while, um, and it became really handy once when I sprained one of my pinkies. I was able to play the full range of the clarinet, which is one of my pinkies versus using both of them in succession. So it actually comes in handy. This one, of course, with a full bone, you can also transpose an A clarinet score. So you have that ability there too, if you just want one clarinet and not two. Of course, some people may want that A clarinet, especially Mozart, required, of course. So that gives us an idea of the model numbers. And you just have to remember that going forward when someone says, oh, I have a R13. Most of the time, they mean the buffet made in 1955 on up. Sometimes they'll say I have an R13 and we're 1932 model. And you can understand it's just the standard bone model. You can confuse them by saying, isn't that an R14 and a half? <laughs> oh, knowledge is key, isn't it? Knowledge is key. But as I mentioned before, that apparently the buffets from 38,000 through 41,000 were designed with a lower joint a bit too large. I'm not sure if they mean length. Some reason I don't think they mean length of the lower joint. I think they mean that they boarded out a little bit too large. That's what I'm guessing. And that would have been basically the entire 1950s produ production range, approximately. The, the serial number range in this time frame is kind of unknown. They only give a range. And if you do mathematics, and basically 38 through 41 ends up being like 1950. But anyways, it affected the clarinets playing the instrument in tune. <laughs> Boring too large to do that. And Buffet was losing business. So that Buffet actually brought in Hans Moening, who somehow corrected the faults. And these instruments were relabeled as an academy model and sold as a student model. I'm not sure where I got all this information from. It could have been the Woodwind form from a long time ago or Buffet's website or someone told me. I don't remember. I ended up talking to a lot of people and a lot of old shops with people that have been there forever. They just remember all this information. Now, I haven't been able to measure up a specific 1950s Buffet, but I had other generations come through. One such one had an academy model, that's serial number 42842, I believe it was. I, yeah, I've written down. And I also had a regular buffet professional model, 42597, which is only 245 clarinets separated the two. So that's quite, <laughs> that's probably as close as we're going to get other than sitting on eBay and buying all these clarinets and looking for serial numbers. But anyways, I had both of them at the same time, and it was really obvious what the differences were when they were measured and actually visually, too. And we'll see that in pictures in just a minute now. But the Academy model, this particular Academy model, not all of them, all the ones I had, they didn't have this. This one had smaller tone holes than a regular Pro model, and it measured out that way. Another one that I had and measured out, measured out basically regular to the regular Buffet Pro model. You know, I kind of wish I measured the lower joint too, but many times I just measure the upper joint. Let's take a quick look at those pictures right now. So this one first, as you can take a look at, this actually has a barrel trill key. So this is a more modern Academy model and it has Academy model stamped just below the buffet emblem. This is the same one. I don't think I measured this one up. I, I you know, you get so many of them come and go. You don't sometimes have the time to do it. 
Sometimes the owner's in a rush. You need a quick job done. You don't have time to measure things up. This one here, during the oiling process, what we want to do is you oil the inside of the bore and the outside of the body, and the wood absorbs that oil. Now, you got to give time for the wood itself to kind of stabilize because as the fibers absorb the oil, it's going to kind of grow a bit and may the non-roundish bores, example, may end up being round again. So you got to give it time. I had a barrel here, a B&H barrel here, that was actually all white. It was like it was whitewashed. It was in water for a while and I lost all the oil from it and had these crevices in it and everything. It looked totally, utterly, you just wanted to throw it away. I'm like, and I was like, this is a good experiment. And I started oiling it. And it started, the cracks, the crevices started disappearing as the fibers reabsorbed oil and it went from white, it was whitewashed like you see on beaches, to getting, if you looked at it now, you'd say nothing's ever been wrong with this. It's quite, quite a learning thing. I learned just from that barrel, just from oiling it. So I just use that same method now and I just oil the inside of the bore and the outside of the body, give it time to grow. If you actually measure the bore, because I came across a clarin that was really shrunk a bit and the bore wasn't round and I oiled it and actually restabilized and the ring on the lower tenon, which was loose, was now tight after a while. But you got to be careful about these things. You, you learn these things over time. As you can see, this one here is cutouts here for the... Uh, Academy model there says underneath it. Some pictures of afterwards. See, see the shared throw key here? Sheet trill key guide. Bad fuzzy picture. I'm actually quite good at making bad fuzzy pictures. <laughs> so here is the prime example I'm looking at. The top one is the regular pro model, and the bottom one is an academy model. I never really investigated exactly the steps they go through when they create these clarinets, but I know they start with, but I know they start with long blocks of wood like this, and then they drill a bore into it. They center a hole and drill it all the way through. Now, and then they make it kind of circular like this with a hole in it. Now, I'm guessing at some point they cut the tone holes after they finished the bore. I'm just speculating now. I have no idea back then. Of course, over time, they modify manufacturing processes, improve them, make them more consistent. Nowadays, it's fairly well automated. Back then, I know watching videos from back then, they hand reamed out the bores. So it's very easy to shove it in there too far and too long and make it too big. Anyways, we can see here, just look at the tone holes. What's really obvious first is right here underneath the throat key. See this tone hole here compared to this one here. This one is smaller on the bottom. And when you see that distinction, all the other ones are also smaller. Every single one of them is smaller, even the CG. And this is the one thing that just when they're sitting right next to each other, it's like, wow, this is just different. It's a student model. If you heard my other videos, usually student clarinets have smaller tone holes for smaller fingers, easier to cover. A lot of doubling sax clarinet players They'll play clarinet, just play clarinet, and the smaller student instruments are easier to play because they usually have smaller tone holes. But there's an obvious difference right there. Here's a later one that I had where the tone holes actually were the regular size. Going here once again is the pictures there. Here's some measurements right here in the second set. It's an extension of the first one. We'll see the, uh, the Buffet Pro 42 versus the Academy 42. First trill key, see these sizes? They're all basically smaller on the Academy model. But the Academy model of 38 that I have in the other picture, they were roughly larger, same size as the Pro model. And this 38, I believe, was within that range we mentioned of um, the 1950s. 
So I measured these out, but I never really measured, measured those ones out. And I didn't measure the bore out at all. I kind of wish I did. But you see here, the caddy model, you see the bore itself is bigger. This is the top of the upper joint. This is the bottom of the upper joint, the exit bore of the upper joint. It's larger. So it's like they reamed it a little bit too much, it seems. And then they cut the tone holes. It could have been their process. You cut the bore first and cut the tone holes just in case you mess it up, you know? But here's another one down below here. Got it from eBay back in 2013, these pictures. It's a 39.5 XX, a 1950s model. This one had label on it. Model Yvette and Schaefer. I remember conversing with the person. I think I got some other pictures from it too, but this was basically, it looked like a professional model to me. It just was labeled Model Yvette and Schaefer. So it looks like anytime they made mistakes, they just, stamped it someplace something else and sold it off because you don't want to throw away the wood after you're 80 90 percent done with it a lot of waste of money so I as a student clarinet <laughs> but this really was an eye opener the smaller tone holes and they all measured out smaller too really an eye opener there but of course these are only a couple examples of academy clarinets You'd have to see more. You'd have to measure them out. I always try to measure out clarinets when I get them, but it sometimes takes time. It's kind of difficult. Even with calipers, it's difficult because if you measure out a hole, it depends upon if you're holding it in the proper position. You kind of have to wiggle it. If it's off like this, it's going to be the wrong size. You know, and I have different tools that are a little bit better, but they have their own problems too. You know, so... And you got to remember R13 tone holes are not cylindrical. They're hourglass shaped. So if you go too far in, you'll get a different dimension. Because I would have to measure near the top, in the middle, and I had other calipers, the ones that cross over, you can actually measure on the insides too. So there's a lot of variations with the academies. I don't know how many variations they had. They had the ones from 1950s. They had later ones that clearly had smaller tone holes. They probably reamed it out too much. I'm guessing the ones in the 50s, they reamed out the lower joint too much. You know, you just never really know. And they probably learned from that to do other ones when they made problems. Who knows, right? Anyway, so there's some information about the Bupay Academy model, or various models, actually. I hope it was helpful. As I learn more information in the future, I'll try to post more information and videos about it. I want to thank you for listening to my ramblings. Any questions or comments, put them down below. Of course, if you found this useful, don't forget to give a thumbs up, like, subscribe, and share. You got to love the knowledge. You got to love life. You got to love clarinets. We'll see you next time.